All right. So um, let me just kind of introduce myself a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'm Chad. I, I'm, uh, I work for Attuned. Um, I've got about 15 years of experience managing very diverse teams, um, mostly in sales and HR, uh, and about five years of experience uh, managing remote teams as well. So that's you know, a lot of people have gotten experience in the last couple of years. I actually uh, had a few years before that to kind of uh, learn about it, make a bunch of mistakes and kind of learn from those mistakes and get better at it. So um, and the final thing is just like, look, I, I love motivation. I love people. I, I really believe I'm fortunate enough to have a job that I love doing. Um, and I think we should all have that. So um, if you want to see my motivation report, uh, this is my attuned report. Uh, you see right away um, competition. Yeah primary motivator. That's one of my need to haves along with altruism and social relationships. If you want a little bit of insight into that, I'll just tell you a very quick story. So um, actually yesterday, uh, a friend of mine um, sent me a message and said like, hey Chad, there's a, a hundred kilometer walk um, between two cities uh, here in Japan where I'm at. And um, he's like, do you want to do it? <laughs> like, I haven't, I haven't run more than like 10 kilometers in probably a year and a half. I do other stuff, but um, yeah, 100 kilometers is a big stretch. So what did I say? Immediately, I said, yes, like, where do I sign up? Um, it's in like three weeks. I'm in no way prepared. But if you give me some competition, if you give me a challenge, um, I'm, I'm going to be all over that. So this is kind of the stuff we're going to talk about a little bit today, getting to understand what that intrinsic motivation for people is. Um, if you guys want to get in touch with me, uh, this, we're going to send this out afterwards. So you can, of course, email me. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, and here's something about a tune. So what is our vision? Well, we want to make work more meaningful. I mentioned, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I feel like I'm doing really important work. Uh, and we feel like that's something that everyone should have. So how do we do that? Well, we help uh, managers to understand their employees. Uh, we help teams to understand each other. And we try to equip everyone with, um, you know, the intelligence and the tools to really take the right actions to reduce conflict and optimize teamwork. So we're going to go through a lot of topics um, in a fairly short amount of time for today's webinar. So I'm going to start with kind of, you know, topic like, is your team truly motivated? So we're just going to talk a little bit about how to recognize a loss of motivation. And this can apply to yourself as well. Um, also, we're going to talk a lot about extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. This is a very interesting subject uh, and one that applies a lot to, to professional lives. Um, and then we're going to talk about work uh, motivation in a hybrid or a remote work environment, how we can visualize uh, motivation. And finally, like three things uh, everyone needs to know if you want to hire um, and retain the best people. There will be a Q&A session. Um, there's a Q&A function in the, in the uh, Zoom here. So if you have a question at any point, you can type it in, uh, and then I'll, I'll kind of answer those uh, as many as I can during the Q&A. All right, so let's just start with that kind of very basic topic. So how to recognize a loss of motivation. And I said this could be for yourself. Um, it, you know, more likely, it's probably for a team or people that you work with. Uh, and so we're just going to start with the kind of like the changes that you might notice in a person that might indicate a loss of motivation. So I'm specific about changes because some of these things, like the first one, which is they're late, there's sometimes very high performing people, very motivated people that are just like chronically late to things. So it's more about like the changes that you might see in people. So if they're late to meetings or if they're late with projects, just kind of late generally, um, that's kind of an early warning sign that something might be going on. A loss of focus. If they used to be really good at prioritizing things, now they seem a little bit adrift. That could indicate that they're maybe avoiding that thing, which is a little bit more difficult, or they feel is uh, something that you know demotivates them. Um, so they're kind of working on other things that are, are maybe not as important or not as critical. Of course, things like quick-tempered, uh, kind of personality changes, um, things when people start getting defensive about their work, maybe they know the quality is not so good, maybe they feel it, um, but they, they're kind of not ready to acknowledge it yet. This is a big one, and there's a big topic around this called psychological safety, which we're going to do a whole nother web webinar on uh, probably next month, but they don't speak up. So 
you know, when you have a motivated group of people, you'll have lots of ideas flying around. Of course, when they're in an environment where they feel safe to speak up, um, that's kind of the, you can see that motivation coming out. Um, when they don't have that environment or they have maybe not feeling that motivation, they're more likely to be quiet and um, not kind of speak their mind, not share their ideas, uh, not, you know, be a, a creative source of information. Um, of course, again, this is changes. Some people are more naturally quiet. They, they prefer to share their ideas in other ways. Uh, and I kind of mentioned it when I, you know, um, mentioned about loss of focus, but they're avoiding problems rather than solving them. Um, and this is one where you can kind of see like, okay, whatever that difficult thing is, they can't quite work up the, uh, the motivation to do it. Um, I want to kind of, you know, transition from that. So we've kind of set a baseline. So, okay, how can we spot this? But motivation is more complex than just like, okay, people are losing motivation. What do we do? We have to understand kind of what motivation is and the different ways that we can motivate people. Because even if you have like everyone in your team is wonderful and they're all performing well and everything's great, you still need to, you know, think about like, okay, um, it can always be better, or we want to maintain this level of motivation uh, all the time. So um, we're going to talk first about extrinsic motivation. This is the one that people kind of understand the best. It's been very well researched, and um, there's a lot of information out, out there uh, about it. So uh, one is this is kind of the classic carrot and stick approach. If you do something good in your job, uh, you get rewarded. If you do something bad, you get penalized, right? So salary and title have long been used as primary motivational techniques. So it's like, okay, you get uh, a new job, you get a better salary, uh, you get promoted, you get a new title and a better salary. These things, and if you look at like our, you know, offer letters, like what kind of offer letters are we putting uh, to candidates, you know, when they're going through the process, what are the two main things that are discussed? Like maybe three, if you add start date, but it's like, it's salary and, and title, right? And this is kind of what we're communicating is like, this is the motivation to do it. But um, we know that it goes uh, much deeper than that. In fact, these kinds of rewards, uh, extrinsic rewards can be counterproductive. And I'll, I'll use an example um, from uh, some experiments that were run uh, a few years ago. So uh, they took two groups of children and uh, they asked both groups to draw a picture. And so both groups did, they handed in their work. One of those groups, unbeknownst to the other group, got a reward. And so they were super happy, of course, they drew a great picture, they got a reward for it, very excited. So later they asked both groups to draw the picture again. The group that did not get the reward and did not know about the reward, they were just as enthusiastic about the project the second time. And they, they completed it, they did it, they were happy. The first group, when they were told they weren't going to get a reward the second time, lost motivation to do it. They were less interested and overall the quality of the work suffered. So this is an example of how these kinds of extrinsic motivation, if it's used in the wrong way, can actually be counterproductive. This is actually known as the over justification effect. If we want to get technical about it, it's when extrinsic rewards cause people to assign too much importance to that reward. And in fact, these kinds of extrinsic rewards can actually push individuals uh, to focus on their own goals rather than those of the team. And if you think about that, it makes sense because if you're, you know, uh, being motivated by salary or promotion, you know, your performance in the team is important, but ultimately that's your success or failure, right? And so we can actually shift um, those motivations to the individual uh, without really intending to. Uh, extrinsic motivation also applies to office parks like free food, ping pong tables, et cetera, like all the things that were really popular a few years ago. Um, these are extrinsic rewards because when you go into the office, you have that sense of like, okay, you know, they're, they're kind of giving me something, right? Uh, let's talk about intrinsic motivation. So uh, this is, it's very important that we kind of differentiate here. We're not looking at behavior. We're not looking at personality. The, the intrinsic motivation is the bottom of the pyramid. So this is really like the, the core values and motivators that a person has. And we can look at that and say, 
This is when people engage in an activity for its own sake, such as seeking out challenges. Hey, do you want to do, do you want to do a hundred kilometer walk? Sure, why not? That sounds great. Let's do that. Um, that's a, a perfect example of like I'm doing that because it's a challenge and it, it sounds interesting. Uh, making your own decisions. Like some people want to be in situations where they're able to decide things for themselves. Um, they can kind of, um, whether that's, you know, having a lot of autonomy at work um, or being able to work on projects where they have the primary decision-making power. And then kind of, uh, I wouldn't say it's the opposite of that, but on the other hand, you have like people who are like highly motivated by cooperating with others. So these are the people that kind of seek out teamwork situations and they really want to work in teams and, you know, they want that mutual um, feeling of uh, cooperation. So um, intrinsic motivation is also linked to high energy levels, um, persistence, uh, it has positive associations with work perform performance and creativity. Um, so all, all of these good things come from intrinsic motivation. It, basically, it's what gets you out of bed in the morning, right? So this is a really different classification um, than those kinds of extrinsic uh, rewards that we've been talking about before and that we're kind of all used to. So I'm going to uh, paraphrase the good professor here. Um, basically, what he's saying here is that motivation is not just, it's not just the level of effort that we spend. It's also like the direction that we put that effort and the persistence that it's applied. And so when you have that high levels of an intrinsic motivation, you're going to put in more effort, sure, but you're also more likely to put it in the right direction and you're more persistent when problems come up. Um, now, that's not to say that intrinsic motivation is all we should care about and extrinsic motivation is bad. Not at all. There's a lot of really good uses for uh, extrinsic motivation. The important thing here is that you understand which one you're looking at and how you're using each. So extrinsic motivation works best for repetitive tasks that link pay to performance. And one of the examples that kind of comes up is um, if you plant trees, and the more trees you can plant in a day, the better, that's actually a good activity to link to uh, an extrinsic motivation. So, you know, you're getting paid per tree, for example, like your motivation is to go fast, to work hard, um, and to plant as many trees as you can. Also, extrinsic motivation works for things that the person previously had no interest in. So if you wanted me to, um, you know, learn something, if you said like, hey, Chad, we need you to learn how to, how to code. Well, I'm not a developer. I'm not an engineer. I've never done that. I've never really thought about it. I don't have a lot of interest in it. Um, if somebody said like, hey, Chad, uh, we're going to pay you to learn how to code. Like, uh, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> I'll try. Um, because like, I, you know, there's that extrinsic motivation uh, that might drive that uh, interest. Will it last? Well, that's debatable. Like, I, you're not going to retrain me to be a coder unless I find something in that activity that, you know, intrinsically motivates me. But the action of getting me to do it, to kind of find that out, that is, is good for extrinsic motivation. So if you're looking for an area to offer rewards, that's a good one. But don't expect that to change them unless they find something within it. And short-term targets. So um, you see this all the time. Like if you've got a sales team, hey, end of the quarter, you know, we're pretty close uh, to hitting our target. We just need, you know, the, the last big push. Well, this is a really good time, and this is a good way to use short-term targets to incentivize a lot of uh, effort and uh, a big push to kind of push something across the line. So it's good for, as I mentioned, sales, uh, you know, project deadlines, things like this. If you need to speed things up, um, this is a good way to do it. Uh, extrinsic motivation, on the other hand, works best for uh, work that requires creativity or problem solving. So um, there's a lot of uh, interesting data that suggests that intrinsic motivation supports innovation um, because it's coming from a place where you you'd quite naturally want to participate in activity. It's going to trigger parts of your brain um, that it might not if you weren't interested in activity. So. 
Uh, it also is best for improving long-term work performance. So understanding, um, again, why people want to do the job that they do, what they find in it, what they're attracted to about that position um, rather than the extrinsic rewards. And then uh, long-term job satisfaction. So actually combining these is a really powerful thing. So, um, you know, I use the example of, uh, you know, me being a coder. Well, if you wanted to, because as I mentioned earlier, I'm motivated by competition. If you really wanted to motivate me and you said like, hey, Chad, you know, uh, I, I think that uh, this person over here is a better coder than you. Um, I think they can be a better coder. So yeah, uh, I'll give you a week to prove that you can be a better coder than them. Like, okay, and if there's a prize at the end of that, that extrinsic reward, like, okay, you got me, right? And so you can combine these things to create uh, a really powerful uh, motivational force. Uh, let's talk about remote work, because um, this is a, a interesting topic for people. A lot of people are having to kind of adjust to this or have adjusted to it. Um, in the last couple of years. So um, I mentioned the trends about office perks are much less effective now than they were a few years ago. Um, actually, even a few years ago, uh, before we were kind of pushed into remote work, people were starting to catch on to what these office perks meant. So it's like, okay, well, you know, at my office, I can eat, uh, you know, lunch, maybe dinner. Um, sometimes they have an exercise room. Uh, sometimes they have these like sleep pods and things like that. Like they're they're really working hard to keep me here, right? Like they must want me to work more. And so like people were already starting to have uh, that feeling that like, okay, these, these you know, perks are, are actually not perks. These might be in the best interest of the company and not me. They're maybe nice to have and they're useful at times, but um, there was definitely two sides to that. So uh, now like what people really value is flexibility. Um, they wanna be able to work from home. And you can see that with some of the larger companies that are still struggling with, with this idea. Um, one of the hard things about remote work is that it really lengthens the time that it takes to learn each other's motivators. So when you are sitting in the office together, you're talking uh, every day, um, there's more likelihood that some of those top motivators are really going to come out and you'll start to learn what those things are. When you have less interaction, uh, you know, it's okay, maybe structured meetings, but there's less of that kind of water cooler talk and less of that casual talk. You're going to, it's going to take a little bit longer to, to learn what these things are. Depending on your motivators, remote work can create unseen barriers as well. So um, I'll give an example. So people that value cooperation may struggle to adapt to a more async communication environment, but people that have a high desire for autonomy might be more comfortable um, working remotely where, yeah, it doesn't matter if they're in the same time zone. It doesn't matter if they're kind of seeing each other constantly. So, you know, Thinking about like everything we've talked about, I think the really positive side here is that we sometimes get really caught up in the things that, you know, the extrinsic things that we can do, but it's important to realize like why people work for companies. So it's actually 66% of employees find motivation in the company's mission and 64% rate that mission as the main reason for staying in their current job. Those are big numbers, right? That's, that's significant. And so I think that you know, understanding this gives us a little bit more confidence maybe to try some new things, to try different things and not get so caught up in, you know, really like the, the traditional race of, you know, what are we paying people? And a lot of the talk around the great resignation is like, okay, well, we have to raise everyone's salary. It's like, well, they, they won't say no, but that may not be the main thing either. So what we're seeing, particularly for remote work, is that company values and organizational fit have become more important. Like, um, you know, because they're not as attached maybe to individuals or to specific teams as they used to feel, um, those company values and organizational fit have kind of taken on uh, more importance. Um, understanding intrinsic motivation and how this impacts team dynamics is key to successful remote work. So. Uh, this is again, you know, when you had a team dynamic where everyone's in the office, you're, st you're going to start to figure it out a lot faster. You're going to start to have more insights into uh, how the team works together uh, and those kinds of things um, a little bit more quickly. 
Um, and actually like onboarding new employees or new managers is much easier if you already know what our, people's motivators are because when somebody's coming into a team or a new manager is, is taking over a team, if they can kind of instantly see a picture of uh, what the makeup of that team is from a motivational standpoint if they can have a meeting with me for example and say like okay cool like chad's motivated by competition and social relationships and altruism like you know that makes their job way easier uh to kind of uh, adjust and, and find the right you know buttons to push with me and to get me to um to do my best work which all raises the question like how can you know a person's motivators well um you know there's the I drew that line earlier between, you know, personality and uh, behavior and kind of really highlighted uh, intrinsic motivation as the fundamentals. And we need to just kind of establish some baselines before we kind of talk about how we can measure it. So it's really important to understand that there is no good, there is no bad. Uh, there's, we're not looking at personality here and we're not looking at skill. So to just give an example, um, you know, having a low social relationship score, this person uh, here is in the neutral, um, does not mean that they're unsociable, right? It doesn't mean that they're bad at social relationships, and it doesn't mean that they don't like having good social relationships. What it means is that they don't need the work environment to provide that for them, right? They, they you know, perhaps they, they have a, a really, you know, great private life and they hang out with people a lot and that's where they get their social relationships from so um, there's a variety of reasons that could be um, but it's important not to get hung up on the idea that okay this would mean that they're unsocial right on the flip side if somebody has something as a need to have let's say autonomy for example and that person is being micromanaged at work that is going to be very demotivating right if they don't have the ability to make some of their own decisions um, then that is going to be a situation where they're very uncomfortable Um, so we can actually generate these motivator reports, and the way we do it is through a 10-minute assessment. It's 55 forced choice questions, um, and through those, uh, those questions, uh, we have uh, machine learning in the background, a decision tree based on first one that you answer, then every subsequent question gets decided, like, how are we going to pair them up? Um, this is a truly unique report, so there is no set percentages that people would, would fall between. There's actually, we had to like you know use uh, aws servers uh, to calculate the number it was like four quadrillion different variations so when people say like hey everyone's a snowflake we're all unique like well from a motivational standpoint yes we've actually we've actually proven that everyone is once we get that information for each individual we can actually plot and look at every person within the team. So this is just an example of what our culture map looks like. You can see what the core culture uh, within a team is or the business. And then you can identify like how people fit. So a typical idea of culture fit, but also what they add, like what are they bringing to the team that might be a little bit different? Um, you know, that's, that's really important to understand, especially as we think about, you know, having diversity in teams and having uh, innovative teams. You don't want everyone to be the same. So understanding where the gaps are might help you manage, um, you know, friction or may help you tailor your communication. So we can also look, take this information and really explore motivator gaps. And this is where uh, you might see um, you know, issues pop up, you might see, like I said, friction come up, but also it just helps to create transparency. So um, I'm using my, my colleague Oleg here as an example. Um, I have such, I have high social relationships. That means like, I, you know, I, it's, it's harder for me to, to sort of work in a vacuum. I, I want to be, you know, talking to people. I want to be working with people. Um, I probably miss going to the office a little bit more than, than other people do. And for, for Oleg, like he understands that about me. And I understand that for him, that's not as big of a thing. So if I'm like, Hey, I'm going to the office on Thursday and he doesn't show up like, okay, cool. Like I understand why that's not as important for him. Now there's different ways that maybe I can handle that um, and that he can handle that. But as long as we have that shared communication and dialogue, it's very helpful for understanding um, you know, how, how we both work. Um, there are certain ones that cause you know, issues. Like for example, if we had a gap in feedback, um, my feedback is fairly low. 
Uh, and so that's not always my default setting. So I'm not always going to give as much feedback as people might want to receive. Understanding that that's a potential gap uh, is, is very, very useful because then, you know, as a manager, I can make sure that I'm going to give more feedback, probably a little bit more than uh, might be comfortable for me, but uh, I can adjust. So, you know, we've talked a lot about motivators and, um, you know, I, again, I kind of mentioned the topic of the great resignation earlier, and I think everyone's trying to figure out um, how they can, you know, number one, hire the best people and retain them. And ultimately, I think a lot of these things come back to motivation. So I wanted to include this, um, even though I'm going to take like a slightly different viewpoint um, on this from motivation, I think all of this stuff links back to motivation. And, and we can talk a lot about um, how uh, understanding motivation and how communicating better will help uh, businesses to hire and retain the best people. Um, I included this uh, little comic. Uh, it kind of relates to my first point. Um, this is probably a really good interview if you're uh, applying to be a product designer at IKEA. And I guess the idea is like, well, if it were me, and if I was the interviewer, I would be like, okay, if you can't put it together in 30 minutes, we're definitely going to hire you because that means our product needs work, right? Um, but if you are not hiring for a product designer at Ikea, that's a terrible interview. And yet sometimes uh, interviewers, we still like to ask silly questions. So uh, I, I think this, I, I hope, I kind of feel like this trend is sort of dying out a bit, um, but there used to be, you know, like I, I've read some truly awful ones. Like if you, uh, if you were a cookie, what kind of cookie would you be? I don't want to answer that question. That's a ridiculous question. But like th these were like legit, like there's books of them, right? It's like, oh, and the idea, uh, of course, is to put, to take someone out of their comfort zone. You know, they, they've really prepared for this interview and like, how can we kind of take them out of that comfort zone? And um, okay, that's one way to think about it. You know, for the more challenging questions, uh, sometimes it's about like, okay, what's your problem solving? Like, how would you approach solving this really difficult or impossible problem? Um, the the problem the problem with that is that uh, it's a super competitive landscape out there. It's it's really difficult um, to hire and and you know find the best people. And when um, you ask questions like that, you're forgetting the fact that an interview is a two way street. They're evaluating you as much as you're evaluating them. And so they have you know if somebody asked me like what kind of cookie would you be if you could be a cookie, I, I'm walking out of that interview. Like, I don't want to work at that company. And so it's really important that we kind of, okay, we, you know, differentiate, but not by um, asking these kinds of questions or, or, or trying to do something like that. Instead, we want to offer a really unique and interesting experience. And what this means is, you know, for example, I like to ask uh, people after they've gone through the interview process with us, um, one of the things that I like to ask is, um, you know, is there something that you've learned from this process? And the answer that most often comes up with us is, of course, we use Attuned uh, during the interview process. We ask them to, you know, take the assessment. And then we have one whole interview where we're just kind of sharing, you know, uh, about their motivations and, and talking about, um, you know, what gets them out of bed in the morning to understand like, okay, cool. Like this is, you know, what you'll enjoy about our company. This is what you might find a little bit more difficult. But at the end of that, like if I say like, okay, well, what is, is there something that you've learned about yourself? They're always going to be able to give an answer and they'll walk away from that experience, whether they get the job or not, feeling like, okay, it wasn't a waste of time. And so whatever that is for you, and, you know, that could be something related to um, a tune, but if you have your own thing that you can kind of uh, add value to their part of the process as well, that'll be hugely beneficial um, to your brand and, and to your overall hiring strategy. Be transparent. So this is one that, you know, uh, again, like it's overwhelmingly, 96%, huge number, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly job seekers want to work at a transparent company. And this starts during the interview process. So again, highly competitive environment. We probably want to sell our jobs quite a lot. We want to, again, you know, motivate them to come in and like really like, okay, this is a great job. You know, you're lucky to be working here. 
the the problem here is that sometimes we gloss over um you know we maybe feel a little bit uncomfortable talking about the hard things and the challenges of the job but there's always those things there's no you know uh, at least in my experience there's no perfect job like every job uh, every position every company has a, has a skeleton or two in the closet and if we don't talk about those things if we're not fully transparent for somebody that's coming in and say like okay this is you know what you'll really like about the job this is what is going to be super hard and you're not going to like this part very much but this is how you can handle it if you're not having those kinds of conversations then they're going to feel like they're going to get the sense like okay it's kind of too good to be true they're going to value that transparency because if you're talking to them about these things in the interview then they kind of know what kind of company they're working for and it'll hit that you know very important value that um, again overwhelmingly job seekers have Give quick, clear, and honest feedback. So this is another big one. We tend to finish our interviews and, you know, it can be a little awkward. Um, you know, you don't want to, if somebody's not going to get the job, it's, it is hard to, you know, reject them on the spot. Like that feels uncomfortable. Um, and likewise, sometimes we play our cards a little too close uh, to the vest when we say like, okay, great, we'll get back to you. You know, you really like the person. Um, but, you know, for, you know, because maybe you're not sure, or I don't know, maybe you're not the decision maker in that process, uh, but we don't give kind of clear feedback. That's something that really needs to change because again, you have to think that all these people, when they walk out the door, they have two or three or four other opportunities. Like there's so many jobs and they could be going straight from, you know, your interview into another interview. And if that other interviewer at the end of that says like, Hey, you we really love you. And, and, you know, we're talking about like, you still have like one or two steps left, but you know, you're, you really, you know, answer these questions well, or on the flip side, if you're not saying things like, Hey, you know, this is like, I think you would probably be great at this. Here's an area where you would struggle. And, you know, an example of that might be if you're hiring for an account executive and you need somebody to handle the full, you know, full sales process, full sales cycle, and somebody just doesn't have enough experience in that. Um, maybe they've been doing kind of lead generation or or sales development. And when you're talking to them, you kind of you see that you feel that tell them that, right? And just say like, hey, this is this is the way I feel. This is my feedback for you. This is what I I think I'm hearing based on what we've discussed. And that actually it does two things. Like number one, it kind of sets their expectations, like, okay, maybe I'm not the front runner here. But also it gives them a chance to say like, oh, well, actually we didn't talk too much about that. I've done this and this and this, and it gives them a chance to maybe add some context or add some information that you didn't have before. And so this idea of giving really quick and honest feedback in the interview uh, is super important to keeping them engaged, keeping them motivated for, for your um, specific job and keeping them aware like, okay, where do they stand? And I would take that as far as, you know, telling candidates like, hey, you know, you're my top candidate or you know you're my top three or, or whatever and just explaining to them how many other people you're meeting and um kind of goes back to transparency right as much information as you're comfortable giving i suggest you do it um, really let, let them know where they stand uh, let's look at some scary stats for retention uh, because i think this is where uh, everyone's a little bit um, worried these days so only 15% of employees worldwide feel engaged. Um, that's a scary number. This is even more scary. So 81% are considering quitting. Um, that's a lot. And then 39% feel underappreciated at work. So to be honest, like I can kind of understand the first two numbers. The, the third one, though, is that's the hardest for me. And the reason is because I don't think, I don't believe that we would look at that number and say 39% of people are underperforming and that's why they're underappreciated. It's like, no, actually, like, I think that the underperforming number is really small. And so we have this huge number, like maybe, I don't know, 30, 35% of people who we really appreciate, we really value their work, but they feel underappreciated. And what that can come down to is that their core motivational needs are not being met. On the other hand, I wouldn't put a bunch of scary stats without putting some better stuff on here. Uh, employees work 20% better when motivated. Like, yeah, it's kind of obvious, right? But that's a very specific number, 20%. And highly engaged teams increase profitability by 21%. 
motivated employees are 87% less likely to resign. So even though they might be thinking about it, like if you have the right motivation, they're more likely to stay. When you consider that the cost of replacing an employee is up to two times their salary, it's really in everyone's best interest to think about these aspects, to think about motivation, to think about um, how we can actually uh, do better, even if we feel like right now our teams are pretty motivated and doing pretty well. There's always a little bit more we can do. And again, we can kind of help those new people, whether it's a new manager uh, or a new employee coming into the team, understand how they can relate, what kind of uh, communication uh, might be helpful for them. All right, let's talk about how to positively impact retention. So um, look, you need to provide better training and onboarding to managers, like new managers. If you're in a high growth business or you just are bringing managers from outside, like uh, it, it's it's hard, right? When you're managing a new team, if you've been working with those people, you know, then maybe you have a much better idea. That's great. But if you're you know, getting promoted into a position or coming from outside, then, you know, you really need that time to kind of learn about your team. And uh, if you can shorten that, then that's uh, really advantageous. Um, not every company will be able to do this, but if you can create flexible work styles like role sharing and flexible hours, workations, things like this, like this is really what people are looking for um, uh, in terms of job satisfaction. Promote a psychologically safe environment. So I mentioned this at the very beginning. Um, you know, psychological safety is uh, very legitimately a big topic right now. And basically, uh, the very simple explanation of this is people feel comfortable speaking up, right? Whether that's you know to disagree, whether that's with an idea, they're in that they feel comfortable, they feel safe. And so they can kind of speak up. And so this really comes down to, again, um, understanding the person, it's EQ, it's motivation, it's all these aspects that we that we bring in. And finally, get to grips with intrinsic motivation. So um, we will be having some more webinars on this. Uh, like I mentioned again at the front, um, psychological safety, I think will be up next. So we're planning that for May. Um, there should be an announcement going out relatively soon. So if you're interested in that, please sign up. Um, and then these other topics, I think we'll, we'll kind of dive into more in future months. All right, so uh, I'd like to move to Q&A now. Um, I did notice there was maybe one or two people that were putting up their hand. Um, what I'd like for you to do, if you don't mind, is, is put the question, uh, just type it out, uh, and then I can uh, go through those. And the first question is um, a great question, actually. Do intrinsic motivators change over time? And the answer is sometimes yes. Um, I'll give you a couple of very real examples um, from my own uh, background. So uh, competition probably has not changed for me since I was 14 or 15. Um, I've always been competitive. I'm kind of outwardly competitive. I like to do competitive things. So it's kind of like every time I've taken the attuned assessment and it's like five or six times now, competition always is 100%. It's always number one. Like the test has me nailed on that one. Um, but two years ago, uh, right when the pandemic was starting and things were kind of crazy, um, suddenly from nowhere, rationality went from the 20s into the 80s. And I didn't know why that was. Um, and in retrospect, what I can look back on now is like, from a business perspective, I needed the company and I needed the people around me to be very focused on making rational decisions. As we work in a startup, it can be a little wild at times. Um, and, you know, like sometimes you make gut decisions. Well, when the, you know, fate of so many people was on the line and we kind of had to survive the pandemic, I needed those people around me to to be making those um, very rational decisions. So uh, yes, they do. Uh, intrinsic motivators can shift. Uh, you know, we've seen things like if you um, are starting a family, maybe, you know, financial needs goes up. Um, there's things like that that can shift and, and move the needle a little bit. Thank you for the question. Um, next question is, uh, does having motivators outside the core culture mean they don't fit the organization or did they they add diversity and prevent groupthink. Uh, it's the second, actually. So we're big proponents of, of culture add um, as, a, as a kind of new idea. And, and so 
Do you want people to fit within the culture of the business? Sure, but from a motivational perspective, sometimes you actually want to hire for culture ad. And I'll give you an example. Like, let's say that you have a team where everyone is uh, fairly low on on innovation. Um, and you know, maybe like again, that doesn't mean that they're bad at it, but it's not their default setting. It's not the thing that's really going to charge them up, right? Hiring somebody that has high innovation will probably be really useful for you because if you want to balance, if you need somebody who's kind of coming up with new ideas and the person that's really going to like, okay, why don't we try this? Why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? That's again, that's not going to motivate them to do that. It doesn't mean they're bad at it, but you'll probably have to drive that as, as a leader. And so, yes, absolutely. Um, hiring for, for culture ad uh, is a, a big thing and something that I, I really recommend. Uh, next question, can you give some examples of how managers successfully tap into intrinsic motivators to boost performance? Um, that's a that's a fantastic question. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I can give a few different examples, I think. So um, I think competition is an easy one, uh, because if you know that from an organizational perspective or from uh, an individual perspective, that someone is highly motivated by competition, that's a pretty easy uh, lever to pull, right? Because all you need to do is kind of set up to give them a challenge, right? And it is important because competition is not one size fits all. Uh, I'm very outwardly competitive, but I guarantee you there's some people that you work with right now who are competing with you and you just don't know it. They're just silently sitting there going like, I'm going to win. And you don't know it because they're not going to, they're not going to say it, right? They're going to, they're going to keep it in, but they are competing with you. And so when you see something like that, um, when you learn that about a person, it gives you that chance to actually really drive their performance uh, through intrinsic motivation. Um, another example is feedback. So, um, you know, when somebody that has a high need for feedback um, is not receiving feedback, their performance is going to suffer. Right? They they want that feedback. They need to feel like, okay, I'm getting you know some positive feedback, some constructive feedback. Um, they really, if they're not getting that, then they're going to feel a little bit like they're working in a vacuum. Um, and that's, that's not going to, it's not going to suit them for very long. Um, and then the final example I'll give is autonomy. And I kind of alluded to it earlier, but um, if you have someone who has very high autonomy and you're micromanaging them, um, you know, and there, it could be for good reason, but it's going to be very demotivating uh, and their performance is going to absolutely suffer. So understanding the flip side that somebody really desires that um, is, is super beneficial because then you can kind of set them projects, uh, get them to work on it, set a reporting schedule. They know everything's outlined and, and they'll kind of deliver on that, right? And they'll be very motivated to do that. So um, thank you for that question. Uh, I think we've got time for just one more. Um, can managers use their own motivator reports to improve their own performance? Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, yeah, I'm going to give another personal example here. So one of my lowest motivators is status. Well, for about five years, I was leading an organization that had status as the number two motivator. It was my biggest gap. And status roughly can translate to respect. It's respect for what you do, respect for your company, um, you know, respect for the vision. And of course, like I value all those things, but I don't communicate it. I don't talk about it naturally. I just, it's in my brain and I'm like, yes, I want all these things, but I, I wasn't very good at explaining it. And one of the big changes in my leadership style is knowing that that was a very motivational thing for people. I made sure to address it in all of my communication to the organization, um, to those individuals that I knew, um, you know, wanted that recognition uh, for a job well done. Um, and it was it was hard for me at first because if you say Chad, good job, you pat me on the back like I'm good for months, like I, that's I'm I'm full, you know. But um, for other people, they they kind of they do they want that recognition and they want to feel like what they do is important. And I totally get that. And so. Um, yeah, when you look at that, you start to understand what your gaps are, um, what you can do better as a manager, how you can relate to more people. Uh, it'll improve your, your EQ, um, your emotional intelligence, um, and your ability to relate to, to people that you, that you work with. So 
Um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, 45 minutes is up. Um, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the attention. Um, last thing, hey, thank you so much. We want to say thank you by uh, giving you a, a free assessment. So we're going to send these out um, along with some other things to follow up on the uh, on the presentation today. Um, and we're also offer like, if you're interested after you do the assessment, if you want a, a free consultation with someone from the team, uh, we're very happy to do that. Um, and hopefully, yeah, we can make everyone's work a little more meaningful. Uh, thanks everyone. Have a great day and thanks for joining us.